Try this example. Where are the electrons coming from? Well, the tail of the arrow here is pointing to the bond between X and Y. So the electrons are coming from the bond between uh, X and Y. I'll go ahead and draw those electrons in. Now, since the tail of the arrow is coming from those electrons, they're moving away from that position. So now I'll erase the bond between X and Y. I've shown a little bit more detail about the molecule over here than I have been in the earlier examples. Um, now, obviously, I hope it's clear that we're not erasing the bond between Y and Z, right? We're only erasing the bond between X and Y. We're not erasing the bond between Y and Z. Uh, this is an important principle that I, I've already kind of mentioned a little bit before. You should only make changes that are dictated by a specific electron pushing arrow. You should only make changes that are dictated by a specific electron pushing arrow. Why did I erase this bond? Because there was a specific electron pushing arrow that told me to. And why do I not erase the bond between the Y and the Z? Because there is no electron pushing arrow that tells me to erase that bond. There is no tail of any arrow coming from the bond between Y and Z. I hope this seems like common sense, uh, but actually this is something that students very often disregard when they're actually drawing their own products. Uh, a lot of times, students don't actually use the electron pushing arrows to dictate what the products are going to look like. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the times, the students just make any changes that feel right. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the method a lot of students use is simply to make any changes that feel good uh, in the molecule. Uh, well, that feel good technique, unfortunately, doesn't work very well. Um, you're not supposed to make the, char the changes that feel good. You're supposed to make the changes that are dictated by specific electron pushing arrows. Well, in this case, there was a tail of an arrow coming from the bond between X and Y, but there was no tail of an arrow coming from the bond between Y and Z. So the, uh, the arrow dictates that we need to erase the bond between X and Y, but there's no reason to erase the bond between Y uh, and Z. So I'm going to leave that bond in there. Now, where is this pair of electrons going to? Well, the head of the arrow is pointing to the W. So clearly the W is going to gain possession of the electrons. Will it be gaining them as a uh, bond or as a lone pair? Well, in the starting materials, the W lacked any possession of this pair of electrons. So it can only end up sharing the electrons in a bond. So the W is going to end up sharing the electrons in a bond. A bond with whom? With whom is W going to be forming this bond? Well, um, it has to be one of the atoms that was originally sharing the electrons. The new bond has to be between W and one of the atoms that was originally sharing the electrons. Well, remember that the two atoms that were originally sharing the electrons were X and Y. Originally, X and Y were sharing the pair of electrons. So it's possible that W could end up sharing the electrons with X, since X was already one of the atoms that was sharing the electrons. And that would give us these products. We formed a new bond between W and one of the atoms that was originally holding, uh, originally sharing this pair of electrons, X. Uh, however, it's again perfectly possible that in fact W is going to form a bond uh, with the other atom that was sharing the electrons originally, which was Y. So here's the other possible set of products. It's possible that um, W is going to end up sharing the electrons not with X, but with Y, because Y was the other atom that was originally sharing the electrons. So here's the other set of products. Again, the arrow is ambiguous. We can't tell which of these products we're going to get. Now, is there a third set of products? Is it possible that W could end up bonded to Z? Is it possible that W could end up bonded to Z? And the answer is no. It cannot end up bonded to Z. 
uh, because Z was not one of the atoms that was originally sharing the electrons. That's just the way uh, electron pushing arrows work uh, in this case. That's something I didn't quite make specifically clear before about these bond to sigma bond transitions. So between which atoms are we going to form the sigma bond? Well, first of all, one of the atoms that has the new sigma bond is going to be the one that's at the head of the arrow. One of the atoms that with the sigma bond is going to be the one at the head of the arrow, which was uh, W in this example down here. And the other atom that forms the new sigma bond is one of the atoms that had the original bond that we broke. The other atom that forms the new sigma bond is one of the atoms that had the original bond. For example, here the original bond was between X and Y. That's the bond that we're breaking. So the new sigma bond has to involve either X or Y. So I'll repeat those ideas. Between which two atoms is this new sigma bond going to be formed? Well, first of all, it's going to be formed with one of the atoms that had the original bond that we broke. One of the atoms that was sharing the original bond that's getting broken here is also going to be sharing the new sigma bond. In this case, the original bond that we're breaking is between X and Y, so the new bond is going to be uh, formed either with X or with Y. On the other hand, the bond that we're breaking did not involve Z. The bond that we're breaking did not involve Z, so Z is not going to be forming the new sigma bond. In both of these cases, Z did not form the new sigma bond. It had to be either X or Y, because those were the atoms that had the original bond that we broke. And then the other atom that forms the new sigma bond is pretty obvious. It's the one that's at the head of the arrow. Here, W is at the head of the arrow, so it's the other atom that's sharing that new sigma bond. This really comes back to the general idea that you can only make changes that are dictated by electron pushing arrows. Um, so the only atoms that are going to go through any changes are atoms that are near the tail of an electron pushing arrow. The only atoms that can um, go through any changes are the atoms that are near the tail of an electron pushing arrow, where there's no electron pushing arrows really in the vicinity of atom Z over here. Uh, that uh, tells us that atom Z is not going to go through any important changes in our products. The tail of the arrow here was between X and Y, so it's X and Y that are going to be uh, uh, going through some changes in this reaction. But there's no tail of an arrow in the vicinity of Z, so Z is not making any changes. So again, one of the big mistakes that uh, students often make is making changes that are not dictated uh, by the electron pushing arrows just because maybe they feel good. Um, you can't make the changes that feel good or the changes that seem similar to things that you've seen before. You have to make the changes that are strictly dictated by the electron pushing arrows. Okay, uh, so hopefully this example here made, uh, made it a, a little bit clearer how to interpret this bond to sigma bond transition. And again, the thing we were trying to clarify is which are the two atoms that are going to form the new sigma bond? Which are the two atoms that are going to form the new sigma bond? Well, one of the atoms that was going to form the new sigma bond is the atom that's at the head of the arrow. And the other atom that's going to form the new sigma bond is one of the atoms that was originally sharing the bond that was broken. And the reason why these arrows can be a little bit ambiguous is it's not really clear sometimes which of those two atoms that was originally sharing the bond that was broken should form the new sigma bond. In this case, X and Y were sharing the bond that was broken, so it's ambiguous whether the new sigma bond should be formed between X and W or between Y and W.